Um, we ask that you please join the FLVS counselors in a warm welcome to Ms. Lori Austere. Uh, Lori serves as the Director of Outreach Services for the Florida Department of Education in the Office of, Finance, of Student Financial Assistance in Tallahassee. Lori has more than 14 years working in the financial aid arena and she truly enjoys assisting students in achieving their higher education goals and dreams. We are honored to have her with us tonight. Please give a warm welcome to Ms. Lori Oxier. But what we're going to do is talk about financial aid, what money is available on a state level, what money is available on a federal level, what's out there privately, and how we can bring this all together in order to pay for your college expenses. Now, there are different types of financial aid. There's gift aid and there's self-help aid. Now, gift aid, of course, is the best kind of aid because it's free. It's money that does not have to be paid back. So those are the things that you are going to want to focus on first and foremost, is finding that free grant, that free scholarship to help pay for your college education. But there's also self-help aid, such as getting a part-time job, um, whether it be you know at Starbucks down the street or whether it be that you go on campus and get a part-time job on campus that can help just defray some of those college expenses. I know that when my daughter started college this year, you know, we sat down and we said, okay, you know, this is what you're going to be paying for, this is what I'm going to be paying for. And, you know, she was able to to outline, you know, out of her part time job, you know, you know, she was going to be responsible for gas to and from campus. She was going to be responsible for her food while on campus. And just the different things so that we had a clear understanding of who was paying for what before she started college. And I think as parents that's something that is really important to sit down and talk with our students about, you know, how this is going to be paid for and who's going to be responsible for what because you don't want to have any area for there to be a misconception or a misunderstanding. I know it was a huge reality check for my daughter to say, okay, now you're going to have to start paying for X, Y, and Z. You know, she's never had to pay for X, Y, and Z, so why did it start today? So it's definitely something that I encourage parents to do is sit down, you know, write out a budget for college and, and figure out who's paying for what. Now, financial aid is based on demonstrated need. That's called um, need-based aid. And that's simply put is to help students who cannot afford the cost of attending college go to college. But there's also merit-based aid. And that's where you can find a scholarship or a grant that's either based on your grades, you know, a special talent that you may have, some type of, you know, leadership thing that you have going on. So there's different types of aid and I encourage you to look for both. Look for need-based aid and look for merit-based aid. The first step in applying for financial aid is filling out the free application for federal student aid. And that can be done online. And the application that's out there and available right now, say you're a student and you're, you're planning on going to college starting in August of 2010. You're going to go online and fill out the 2010-2011 free application for federal student aid. That form will require you to submit your 2009 tax return information. If you're a student and you're planning on going to school in the summer, so you're going to start a little early, then you would need to go online and also fill out the 2009-10 FAFSA with your 2008 tax return. So that's very important. Um, students really need to make a decision now as to when they're going to start school and if so, do they need to fill out just the 10-11 FAFSA or do they, do they need to fill out both? And if we see someone get lost in the shuffle, that's usually where it, they get lost, is not realizing that you have to do a FAFSA for every academic year in college. And we encourage students to fill out the application as close to January as you possibly can because when you're submitting in your FAFSA, schools are using that information to determine eligibility for other need-based aid um, that is available there on campus. So I definitely encourage you to do it as quickly as possible. If you usually don't do your taxes until April, go ahead, fill the FAFSA out using your last year tax return as an estimate. And then once the, um, 
once you do your taxes, you can actually go back in and update that. So I, I definitely encourage you to do that as quickly as you can, um, even if you are using the estimate. Now again, you're going to be doing this online, which is great. It's going to be done at fafsa.ed.gov. And I've got a screenshot here. Well, I'll, I'll get to the screenshot in just a moment. But you want to make sure that you're following your school deadlines, your state deadlines, because those are different than the federal guidelines that involve the FAFSA. For instance, um, your school may be saying, um, we want your FAFSA on file here by March 1st in order to ensure that your financial aid will be in place for the fall semester starting in August. And all of those deadlines are available on the school's website. So just make sure you're watching that. And then for the state, um, for example, we have some scholarships that are available through the state of Florida and we say you must have your FAFSA in by X date. So you want to make sure that you're watching that and making sure that you're meeting all of the, there's three separate deadlines for one form. So you just want to make sure you're juggling that. The second thing is the confirming your dependency status. Now there is a series of questions. When you go online to fill out your FAFSA, it's going to ask you a series of questions like, were you born before a certain date? Do you, are you married? Do you have any dependent children that receive more than 50% of your support? And it just guides you through all of these questions. And at the end of those series of questions, it determines are you a dependent student or are you an independent student? Now, dependent students are required by law to submit their parental tax information. Now, there are situations where that may not be available. There may be situations where um, the student no longer has contact with the parent. There could be a number of reasons where you go through that form and it says the student is dependent, but there are circumstances that really prevent them from meeting that criteria. And that's okay. There is there's a process, it's called professional judgment, and what students can do who are in that scenario, they can go to their financial aid office and say, hey, I did my FAFSA, it asked for my parental information, but here's why I can't provide that to you. And then they can look at that situation, they can look at the documentation that you have about it, and they can make a determination and do an override and say, you know what, You're, you don't need to do this. Now, it's not a common practice, but when there are extenuating circumstances, I always encourage students, you know, reach out and look at, you know, talk to someone in that financial aid office that can help you determine whether or not you truly have to provide that parental information. If you don't feel comfortable talking to them, you can always um, give me a call and I'll review the situation with you and, and make a determination whether or not I think that you have enough proof to go to the school and say, you know what, we, we need to fill this out. Um, because I don't want anyone to be discouraged to think, well, I can't fill the form out so I can't go to college and they just give up. And, and that's not true. There are definitely ways where we can work with unique circumstances and, and situations. The other thing is you're going to be searching for school codes on the FAFSA. You can fill out, I think it's up to 10 schools now that you can put on there that you're interested in applying to. So you want to do that. You want to, you know, you know if you're, you're considering the University of Florida, maybe you're considering um, University of Central Florida, maybe you're considering FSU, you want to put all three of them down because that way when you're processing your FAFSA, they're all going to get a copy of your report. And when they get that report, they're going, okay, well, if you go to school A, you would qualify for X number of dollars in financial aid. If you go here to school B, you may qualify for Y number of dollars. And that gives you a little bit more ammunition into deciding what school is going to be the right fit for you. Because you may qualify for a merit-based scholarship at school A that you wouldn't receive at school B. So 
it may wait, you know, it may sway your decision and well, maybe I should go to A because if I go to school A, I'm going to get three thousand dollars more in aid per year than if I went to school B. So it's definitely something that I encourage students to do is is you know anybody that you're considering any school that you're considering going to, definitely I would definitely um, have you put the school codes out there and just that way you can make a determination. You're also going to need to figure out how you're going to submit the FAFSA. I'm going to tell you, electronically is definitely the way to go. It's 14 days faster um, because you can sign it electronically, you can submit it electronically. And here on the screen, you can see that there's a website, pen.ed.gov, where you can establish a PIN prior to the application process. But the FAFSA has changed now to where you can actually do this during the application process. So you're not even having to go to that site separate website unless you want to. If you go into FAFSA.ed.gov, you're filling out your FAFSA, you get to the signature place, it'll ask you, do you have a pen? If you say no, it'll help you apply for one right there and you can sign it and submit it electronically right there. If you want to manually sign it and send it in, you can do so, but again, it's going to take about two weeks longer, so I, I discourage you from doing that. These are some of the forms that you're going to need before you complete the FAFSA, just so that you have all your ducks in a row. That way, when you're sitting down to fill out the FAFSA, you have everything that you, you need right there in your hands in order to fill it out. So it's a great little checklist. You can also actually go online to this website, fafsa.ed.gov slash before012.htm, and download a FAFSA on the web worksheet. This is a great tool. You can fill out the FAFSA on the web worksheet manually. Then when you sit down at the computer to fill out your FAFSA online, you're it just goes step by step by step. So it's a great little cheat sheet. And um, especially if you're, if you're kind of anxious about being online, which I guess probably you all aren't, but it's, it's definitely a, a great tool if, if you're more comfortable filling out something paper than electronic. Again, this is just, you know, just how to complete the, the FAFSA electronically. And what I did was I, I gave you a screenshot here of what the FAFSA website looks like. And you can see in the upper left-hand corner, it says start here, go further, federal student aid. And it's got the U.S. Department of Education seal. I want you to see what this website look like, looks like simply because there are some websites that have similar website addresses, but they actually charge a fee for you to complete your FAFSA. So I definitely want to to keep you on the free application for federal student aid versus paying someone $79.99 to do it on your behalf. Um, this is a free application. You can do it yourself without any issue. If you get stuck, you can always call me for help and I will be giving you my contact information at the end of this presentation so that if you do need help. But there's also, while you're in this application um, online at fafsa.ed.gov, there's a chat window where you can chat directly with a representative from the U.S. Department of Education. They have a 1-800-4-FED-AID phone number that you can call. There's a frequently asked questions section that you can pull up. You know, this is, it's a great resource and it's so simplified now that it, it, it is very, it, it's just a breeze to do. I did my daughter's FAFSA and my FAFSA earlier um, in February and probably with both of our applications, it probably took me about 15, 20 minutes to do both of them. That's how simple it's become. So I definitely encourage you to, to do it online. If you want to do it via paper, you can download um, a copy of the application directly off of the website. You can call 1-800-4-FED-AID and get a copy of it. And then if you want to sign it and send it in, those are the instructions on how to do so.